Okay, so we're there in Genesis chapter number 20, and um, we'll just jump straight into it. So we had, we've had we been, we actually we took a while getting through Genesis 18, a couple of weeks, and then Genesis 19, a big chapter. Jump, just jump straight into verse number 1 of Genesis chapter 20. Basically what we're going here is Abraham's continuing moving on. Look at verse number 1. It says, And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country, and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur, and sojourned in Gerah. So Abraham is journeying, journeying on towards the south. Now, when you hear that Abraham journey towards the south, does that ring a bell? Does that sort of sound like I've heard something like this before? Have a look back in Genesis chapter number 12. Genesis chapter number 12 and verse number 10. Genesis chapter number 12, actually verse number 9, excuse me. Genesis chapter number 12 and verse number 9 says, And Abram, because of course remember Abraham was originally was called Abram, Abram, and Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass, when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they shall kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister that it may be well <clears throat> with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman, that she was very fair. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidst thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now therefore behold thy wife, um, take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Now just reading through that, you might think, this is just like deja vu. It's just like the same, the same things happening again. And so, we see that that's exactly what's going on. Basically, um, what had happened back in chapter 12, Abram, he went down to Egypt because there was a famine. Okay, And um, and what did he do? He said to, in fact, go back, turn back to Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20, verse number 2. Ab Abraham, as he's now called, Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gera, sent and took Sarah. So Abraham tells people, and it's, it's not just that, it's wherever he goes, he's, this is a common thing with him. He's telling people, you know, this is my sister. This is my sister. Okay. And because of this, Abimelech, the king, he takes Sarah to his house. It's like he's going to take her to be his wife. Okay. Now, do you think that was really a good idea from Abraham's point of view? Do you think that was a really good idea? I'm going to tell people she's my sister. What to sort of so to keep myself out of trouble so that no one's going to. Hang on. I mean, I mean, back back in, back in chapter twelve, he was saying because I thought they were going to kill me. Okay, so I mean that, that's really what it comes down to. Abraham, out of fear, he pretended, tried to pretend that, that Sarah was his sister. But I mean, did he really think through what was going to happen? So then someone could then take her to be their wife, and it's like, that's my wife is gone to be with some some king somewhere in, in their house. Okay, and so he was scared of what was supposed to happen, could happen to him. But that's it's not really a, a very sensible thing to think. I mean, the fact is. He may have been travelling in a bad place. People may have been going to do bad things, but he should really have been prepared to whatever came. He was, it was his job to protect his wife, to stand up for his wife. In fact, have a look. Turn to Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Have a look at Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse number 25. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 25. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands love your wives... Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So saying what? Christ loved the church, how much? That he died for it. So how much should husbands love their wives? They should love their wives and be prepared to die for them. In the same way Christ loved, his, loved the church and died for it, we should love our wives and be prepared to die for them. That's the sort of love. In fact, it actually says in John chapter 15, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Okay, that's the greatest love someone can have. Well, shouldn't your wife be your friend? Absolutely, and she should be your she should be your best friend. I mean, she, my wife is my best friend. 
And you know, if you're married, your husband, your wife, they should be your best friend. Mm. You know, that's that's important. That that's that's what God desires. But well, if that's the greatest love you can show is to lay down your life for your friends, we mm. should be prepared to lay down our lives for mm. our wives. Okay, mm. and that's that's a, so that's Abraham. What he was doing here, this was wrong. This is something that he shouldn't have done. And I mean, the thing is, if you think about it, he should have learned. I mean, he's done it once already, and it didn't work. And he's still doing the same thing again. Okay, um, turn back to Genesis chapter number twenty. Genesis chapter number 20 and verse number 3. Genesis chapter number 20 and verse number 3. It says, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night, and said to him, Behold thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. So God comes and warns Abimelech. He says, Look, you're in trouble, because this lady, Sarah, she's actually Abraham's wife. So you're in trouble. You know, he warns him about this. Have a look at um, verse number 4. But Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? So Abimelech, he hadn't actually come near. So he had taken her into his house. No, nothing, had, nothing had gone on. Nothing had happened in there. But notice also what he says. He says, um, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? So what did Abimelech think about his nation? What did he think about himself? He thought he was righteous, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He thought his nation was righteous. Was it really a righteous nation? Do you think it was really a righteous nation where it was? I mean, you know, this is sort of the land of the, the Philistines, I suppose you'd say, in, in, in the south there. And so, but the thing is, the Bible says that every way of a man is right in his own eyes. So Abimelech, he didn't think he'd done anything wrong. He thought what he was doing was fine. He thought that he was righteous. And in fact, when we go soul winning, that's an important thing that we need to get across to people. We need to get across to them that, no, you're not righteous. The Bible says there is none righteous no, not one. And that's why we show people scriptures mm. on hell. We show them scriptures on sin, showing them that mm. they're sinners and that they deserve hell because that's what God says. And it's important because if someone doesn't believe that, how can they be saved? But, mm. you know, Abimelech, he thought mm. that he was righteous. He thought it was a righteous nation. Have a look at verse number five. Verse number five. Um, he says, said he not unto me. So he's saying, look, I, I, I'm righteous. He says, said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands, have I done this? So Abimelech's basically saying, he said he's innocent because Abraham has said that Sarah's my sister. Okay, mm -hmm. so he said, because he said, this is my sister, that means that I'm innocent for what I've done. But did that really make it right for him to take her? No, it didn't. Okay, it, 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 didn't, make it, it didn't make it right for him to take her. I mean... Put it this way, do you think he, how about this, I mean, we read later in the chapter that he had another wife, didn't he? He already had a wife, so it wasn't as though he was, you know, wifeless and he was taking, didn't take a wife. No, he, he already had one. But not only that, do you think he asked Sarah if she wanted to come to his house and to be an additional wife? Do you think that's what, do you think that's what he said to her? No. I don't think so, because why? What do you think Sarah would have said? No, thanks. So I don't think that's I don't think that's that, that's what happened. I think what happened is just he was the king, and so he just took her. His men probably said, "Right, you're coming with us. You're coming. You're coming to the king." Okay. So because does the Bible teach that a man can just take a woman and force her to be his wife? Does the Bible teach that anywhere? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Now, some people, and I'm not going to go into it again, but some people have there's there's, there's, there's a passage that they use to claim mm -hmm. that. Um, in fact, if you look in the modern versions, the modern versions actually says that if a man takes a, a, a you know a, a, a damsel who's not not betrothed or anything like that, and takes her and rapes her, then he's got to pay the dowry to her father, and she's got to become his wife. Now that's not what the Bible says. The Bible, the King James Bible, doesn't say he takes her and rapes. The, the King James Bible says, and this it's in Deuteronomy, it says that if a man lay hold on her and lie with her. Now, it doesn't say that he rapes, it just he lays... Now, how can you possibly lie with someone unless you lay hold on them? You can't, okay? Mm. And so this is just saying, if someone goes and sleeps with someone, you know, a, a young man takes a young woman, and they go and sleep together, the Bible says what should happen, he should pay the dowry, marry her, she'll be his wife, you know, mm. that's till death do us part. That's what should happen, okay? It says nothing about if you rape someone, then, then you've got to marry them. And, you know, that's, that's just crazy talk. But some people do have the idea to say, well, look, what about, you know, this idea of like forced marriages or, you know, someone else 
Someone, you, you're not having a choice as to who you marry. Is that what the Bible teaches? Well, let's have a look. Have a look at um, Numbers chapter number 27. Numbers chapter number 27. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Numbers chapter 27, and verse number 1. Numbers chapter 27, and verse number 1. Numbers 27, verse number 1. It says, Then came the daughters of Zelophehad, the son of Hepher, the son of Gilead, the son of Maker, the son of Manasseh, of the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. And these are the names of his daughters, Mala, Noah, and Hogla, and Milcah, and Terza. And they stood before Moses and before Eleazar the priest and before the princes and all the congregation by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Our father died in the wilderness, and he was not in the company of them that gathered themselves together against the Lord and the company of Korah, but died in his own sin and had no sons. Why should the name of our father be done away from among his family, because he hath no son? Give unto us, therefore, a possession among the brethren of our father. And Moses brought their cause before the Lord. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelophehad speak right. Thou shalt surely give them a possession of an inheritance among their father's brethren, and thou shalt cause the inheritance of their father to pass unto them. Mm -hmm. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a man die and have no son, then ye shall cause his inheritance to pass unto his daughter. So what it's saying is, you know, there's a situation where, you know, someone had, had died, and the only children they had were, were daughters. Now, normally the inheritance would pass to the son, okay? Or the son would be divided among, amongst the sons. But this was this person, they had no sons, they only had daughters. And so they're saying, look, we, our father's died. What's going to, is, is the inheritance of our father's is just going to, is it going to be gone? And so they brought it to the Lord and they said, no, they, they can have the inheritance. It's fine for them to have the inheritance. But that's not where the story ends. Have a look at now Numbers chapter number 36. Numbers chapter number 36 and verse number one. Numbers chapter 36. So God's already said they're going to get the inheritance. But now look see what happens in verse 36. And the chief fathers of the families of the children of Gilead, the son of Maker, the son of Manasseh, of the families of the sons of Joseph, came near and spake before Moses and before the princes, the chief fathers of the children of Israel. And they said, The Lord commanded my Lord to give the land for an inheritance by lot to the children of Israel. And my Lord was commanded by the Lord to give the inheritance of Zelophehad, our brother, unto his daughter. So they're just recounting what we saw before. And if they be married to any sons of the other tribes of the children of Israel, mm. then shall their inheritance be taken from the inheritance of our fathers, and shall be put to inheritance of the tribe whereunto they are received. So shall it be taken from the lot of our inheritance. And when the jubilee of the children of Israel shall be, then shall their inheritance be put unto the inheritance of the tribe whereunto they are received. Mm. So shall their inheritance be taken away from the inheritance of the tribe of our fathers. And Moses commanded the children of Israel according to the word of the Lord, saying, The tribe of the sons of Joseph hath said well. This is the thing which the Lord doth command concerning the daughters of Zelophehad, saying, Let them marry to whom they think best. Only to the family of the tribe of their father shall they marry. So shall not the inheritance of the children of Israel be removed from tribe to tribe. For every one of the children of Israel shall keep himself the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. And every daughter that possesseth, possesseth an inheritance in any tribe of the children of Israel shall be wife unto one of the family of the tribe of her father, that the children of Israel may enjoy, enjoy every man the inheritance of his fathers. Mm -hmm. So what it's basically saying is, these people are saying, look, if these, the, the inheritance of their father went to these daughters, mm -hmm. it says, well, look, if they marry people from other tribes, then part of the land, because the land was like supposed to be divided up, different, different people were supposed to have different inheritance, different parts of the land. You know how you pass something on from father, to son, and so forth. And so what would happen is this, there's an area, you know, this area is for the tribe of Judah, this is for Manasseh, this is, you know, Joseph, all these different tribes had different areas of land. But what would, and, and within that, obviously there'd be a portion for this particular group of the family, and this particular group, and this particular group. Mm -hmm. So what would happen is because this inheritance had passed to the daughters, if they marry someone from another tribe, then the inheritance would go to that tribe. It's kind of like, I mean, maybe think of someone, someone getting married and like they're, maybe they're, they're, they're the, the child of a, of a, of a multi-millionaire. And they get married, okay? And so, and they inherit the stuff from their, from their father or, you know, or the millions of dollars. But then what happens is there's a separation. Now, just think in worldly terms. So think there's a, you know, there's a divorce. And what happens? It gets split, doesn't it? You hear about people, they marry someone famous or someone really wealthy. And then they break up, and then suddenly the millions again. And that's why they have these prenuptial agreements and all this sort of nonsense. But the, but the principle is it is to show that, to see that something that belonged to one family 
because of what's happened, it's gone somewhere else. In this case, because of, because of marriage, it would go to this other family. So what happens, what Moses said has to happen is these people can marry, but they need to marry to someone from the same tribe. So it means that it's not going to disappear off to another tribe because it's all still within the tribe of you know Benjamin or the tribe of Ephraim or, or Manasseh or whatever it may be. Do you understand? So that, that's what's going on. But the key point I wanted to notice is verse in number verse six. Mm. It says, um, verse number six, this is the thing which the Lord doth command concerning daughters of Lofa had, saying, Let them marry to whom they think best, only to the family of the tribe of their father shall they marry. So it was only to the tribe of the of the of the of their father shall they marry. But notice also said, let them marry to whom they think best. So whose choice was it for them to who they had to marry? It was their choice. They can marry who they want to. There was a limitation within this tribe, but anyone in that tribe, mm. you can choose to marry who you, whoever they think best, okay? Mm. And so that's an important thing, is that there is, the people are allowed, you know, it's not forced marriages, mm. okay? The, the Bible doesn't teach that. In fact, we see, even see the same thing in the New Testament. You don't need to turn there, but 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39, says the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she's at liberty to be married to whom she will, in fact, it says, only in the Lord. Mm. So what that's saying is, you know, you've got a couple of married, and then the husband dies, you've got a widow, and so it says, well, look, she can get married to, she's at liberty to be married to whom she will. She can marry whoever she wants. But then it says, only in the Lord. And what that's talking about, obviously, Corinthians is a letter written to believers at Corinth. And so the idea is, if you've got, you know, believers, when they marry, they should only marry other believers. Mm. Okay, that's what the Bible teaches. And, and the thing is, that... If you if people ignore that, they get themselves in a world of trouble. There's nothing but there's nothing but pain and heartache and stuff because there's going to be a conflict. You know the Bible says, "Can two walk together except they be agreed?" You've got someone that loves, that's saved, that loves God, wanting to follow, wanting, wanting to follow God, and someone that doesn't. What's going to happen in the home? It's going to be a place of conflict and strife. You know, and so God says, "Look, you know, marry who you want to, but in the Lord." Okay. Let's get back to Genesis chapter 20. Genesis yeah. chapter 20, verse number 6. Genesis 20, verse number 6. <clears throat> Genesis 20, verse number 6. And God said unto him in a dream, this is speaking to Abimelech, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me, therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Okay, so God basically, he speaks to Abimelech in a dream, and he said, yeah, I stopped you from touching Sarah, okay? And, and I think it's not necessarily that he was keeping Abimelech from sinning in the sense that um, the reason he, it wasn't for Abimelech's sake, he actually did it for Abraham and Sarah's sake, I'm pretty sure. In fact, we'll see as we get through. So look in verse number seven. He says, Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know that thou... So know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. So God tells Abimelech, look, you need to restore Sarah back to Abraham or else. There's going to be trouble, isn't there? I'm, 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 going, to, I'm going to kill you. In fact, there's going to be probably more than just you who's going to be suffering because of this. Now, turn, if you would, to Psalm 105. Turn to Psalm 105 because this recounts. Um, in fact, I love this, some of these Psalms. They go through a lot of these stories and you learn more about them. As you go through these psalms, have a look at Psalm number 105. Look at verse number 1. Psalm 105 verse 1 says, O give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name, let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in his strength, seek his face forevermore. Mm. Remember his marvellous works that he hath done. So sing, look, remember the marvellous things that God has done. His wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O ye seed of Abraham, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen. He is the Lord our God, his judgments are in all the earth. He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan, the lot of your inheritance, when they were but a few men in number, yea, very few and strangers in it. So this is talking about how he promised to Abraham, and you know, he, I'm going to give you this land when there was hardly any of them. 
um, verse number 13. When they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people. See, this is what Abraham was doing, wasn't he? He was wandering around from place to place. Verse 14. He suffered no man to do them wrong. It means he allowed no man. He suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes. Remember, Abimelech's a king. Saying, touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. So what this is saying, this is recounting how God reproved kings. He told Abimelech, don't touch Abraham. Why? Because Abraham was a prophet. He was, he was anointed, you know. And so what this does is this shows God's protection mm -hmm. to his people. Okay, God protects his people. And in particular, in the Old Testament, when it refers to God's anointed mm -hmm. and, and, and the prophets, they were actually a selected few. You know, not everybody was anointed of God. Not everybody in the Old Testament was a prophet of God. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, you know, often we, we read about that the Spirit of God came on people. And often when that happened, they would prophesy. Okay? Um, you can see that, for example, in Numbers chapter 11. Have a look at Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11 and verse number... Numbers 11 verse number 14. Numbers 11 verse number 14. And this is Moses speaking here. Moses is speaking in Numbers 11, 14. He says, I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. Mm -hmm. so, so Moses is feeling a bit down about this. He's, you know, all the burden of these people. Mm -hmm. And he says, verse 15, and if, <clears throat> excuse me, and if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand. If I found favour in thy sight and let me not see my wretchedness. wretchedness. So did Moses feel pretty down? He did. Mm -hmm. He felt down. He, he said, kill me, in fact. Um, verse number 16 and the Lord said unto Moses gather unto me 70 men of the elders of Israel whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people and officers over them and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation that they may stand there with thee and I will come down and talk with thee there and I will take of the spirit which is upon thee that's upon Moses and will put it upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee that thou bear it not thyself alone so he's saying look I'm going to spread the load around Verse number 18. And say thou unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh. For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. Ye shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even <clears throat> a whole month, until it come out at your nostrils, and it be loathsome unto you, because that ye have despised the Lord which is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why? came we forth out of Egypt. Okay, so what we're seeing here, what, the, what had caused the problem is these people, remember God provided manna for them in the wilderness? He, he, he fed them with manna. But the people got sick of it. You know, God was providing them with miraculous food. They're in the middle of the desert, and he's providing them with food. You know, raining manna from heaven. They got sick of it. They complained. They said, oh, if only we're back in Egypt where we could have flesh to eat. Okay, so they're complaining and moaning. And the thing about it is, is that they complained... And God heard them. And does God like it when people complain? God didn't like it. But the thing, is, the thing is, sometimes God, when people complain, sometimes God will actually give them what they want. But what it turns out is what they want is not really what they thought it was going to be. I mean, in fact, it actually says um, in Psalm 106, for example, it talks about this, Psalm 106 says, that they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness. This is talking about this exact event. And tempted God in the desert. And then it says... And he gave them their requests. He gave them what they wanted. It says, but sent leanness into their soul. So they asked for it, but it wasn't like, I mean, in fact, that's what he says. It's actually, you're going to eat flesh, but you're not going to eat it one day or two days or 10 days or 20 days, but for a whole month until it comes out your nostrils. Do you want to eat meat, eat flesh until it's coming out your nose? Mm -hmm. Has there ever been sick? There's nothing worse than being sick and it comes out your nose. It's just, it's like... That's just, that's a really, that's a bad thing. That's what he's saying, look, you're going to be sick of it. You're going to be absolutely sick of this. Okay, have a look at verse number. So would that be raw flesh? Raw flesh? That would have cooked it, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because, you, and you don't eat with the blood. Verse number, mm -hmm. verse number 21, look at verse number 21, still in Numbers 11. And Moses said, the people among whom I am are 600,000 footmen. And thou hast said, I will give them flesh that they may eat a whole month. Shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them to suffice them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? And the Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord's hand waxed short? Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. 
And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him, that's upon Moses, and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. So when the spirit came on them, what did they do? They prophesied. They preached. And so we see the Holy Spirit is associated <coughs> with people prophesying. Have a look at verse number 26. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad, and the name of the other Medad. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Spirit rested upon them. And they were of them that were written, but went not out into the tabernacle. And they prophesied, or they preached in the camp where they were. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Invest thou for my sake. Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. So Joshua saying, look, you know, you need to forbid these people because look, this, you know, these people are preaching here in the camp. You need to tell them no. And what does Moses say? He said, actually, no. He says, would God that everyone was a prophet and that God would put his spirit on everyone? Mm -hmm. Well, let's have a look at this. Turn to um, Acts chapter number 2. Turn to Acts chapter number 2. Because in the Old Testament, that wasn't the case, was it? Everyone wasn't a prophet. Everyone didn't have God's spirit resting upon them. Look at Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 16. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 16. Acts 2, 16. It's on the day of Pentecost, and it's Peter speaking. He says, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So what does God say is going to happen? He's going to pour out of a spirit and people are going to preach. They're going to prophesy. Okay? And so, in fact, we actually later on, we see this actually happening. We see, for example, if you look at um, Acts chapter number 4, Acts chapter number 4 and verse 24, Acts 4 verse 24, <clears throat> Acts 4 verse 24, says, mm -hmm. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, against his Christ. Mm. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Mm. So what we see here is we see people being filled with the Spirit mm. and speaking God's word boldly. And who did it say it was in Acts chapter number 2? It says on your sons and on your daughters. You know, young men, old men, maidens, on everybody, God's pouring out a spirit. And what are they going to do? They're going to preach. Okay? They're going to preach. And so the thing is, and one of the evidence you can see of this, when you see it happen, how do they preach? Do they preach timidly? Do they preach fearfully? Or do they preach boldly? They preach boldly. It says in 2 Timothy 1.7, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You see, when God's Spirit comes on people, mm. they speak His word boldly. Okay. Now, when what that means, if someone is not speaking boldly, are they filled with the Spirit? Mm. No, they're not. Because when God's Spirit's on someone, mm. they're going to speak His word boldly. When someone's fearful and afraid, that's not the Spirit. Okay? And so you can see, you can tell when the Holy Spirit's on someone. You, if you have a pastor, if you have a preacher, and he doesn't preach things from the Bible because he's scared, mm. like he knows what the Bible says, but he won't say it because what would so-and-so think? What would so-and-so? I, I, I'm not going to say this. If I say this, oh, they might all leave. Has he got the Holy Spirit on him? Now, 
if he's saved, obviously he's got the Holy Spirit in him. He's got the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But that's a different thing from the fullness of the Spirit. Because we see in the book of Acts, over and over they prayed, and the Holy Spirit comes and fills them again and again and again. Okay? Because the Holy Spirit is something that can come upon people. In the Old Testament, we saw that. God put his Spirit on people when he had tasks for them to do. You know, the Holy Spirit came upon Samson. You know, it came upon, came upon King Saul. You know, when they did these mighty acts, God's Spirit was upon them. Okay? Now, just notice something about this, though. Turn back. Uh, we'll, oh, actually, go back to Psalm 105. So keep your finger in Genesis 20. You'll go to Genesis 20 as well. But I just want to notice this phrase. And at the end of Psalm 105, we read verse number... Um, yeah, so we saw verse number 14. He suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. Mm. Now, this expression, touch not mine anointed, do my prophets no harm. Mm. Sometimes people, I've heard people use this mm. to suggest that, what's the word for it? I've heard preachers and pastors talk about you know, how just like the, the Old Testament prophets and stuff, mm. that, 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 a, that, a, that a New Testament pastor or preacher is like that. And saying, therefore, because the Bible says, touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm, that means you can't touch the man of God. That means you need to treat him with the utmost respect, and you need to be very careful, and you need to, you need to have this, this huge reverence for him. Now, just so we understand, the Bible does teach that we should have respect for elders, you know. I mean, and someone, if they're a pastor or a preacher, they should be an elder, okay. The Bible says they shouldn't be a novice, okay. But there's people can take this too far, and I think a lot of people take this too far, okay. Um, turn to Psalm, you're in Psalm 105, look at Psalm 118, Psalm 118, verse number. Psalm 118, verse number 8. Psalm 118, verse number 8 says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. So the Bible says it's better to trust in, in God than to trust in a person. Even a prince, even someone who's important, even someone who's got authority. Now, a pastor is important. A pastor has authority in the church. We're supposed to treat them with respect. Mm. But should we be trusting them? Should we be trusting pastors? Because a lot of people do. A lot of people trust pastors. A lot of people will blindly follow a pastor. Because if the pastor says that, it must be right. Well, where does the Bible teach that? Where does the Bible teach that? Let's have a look at some scriptures with our, with our, with our turn. Have a, look at, um, have a look at Hebrews chapter number 13. Hebrews chapter number 13. You see, people... I've heard pastors and preachers, they, they teach this as like this blind obedience. And it's not, it's not biblical. Look at Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 17. Listen to this. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch, out, for, they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable to you. So it says, Obey them that have the rule over you. Now, that, that's actually talking about elders within the church because it says, you know, the elders that rule well should be counted worthy of double honour. Okay, and it talks about in um, the end Peter chapter 5. Sorry, it's just slipped my mind what he says, but I'm sure he says something about that. Um, it was just saying Hebrews, but in Peter chapter 5, uh, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but every mind. So it's something you've got the oversight of. You do have the rule over them, but... When we read verse 17, which says, Obey, then have the rule over you, submit yourselves. Before we read verse 17, we should have read verse 7. When you read, your, do you normally do that? Each chapter you sort of read, you start at the start of the chapter and read through? That's what I like to do. Have a look at verse number 7. Have verse number 7. It says, Remember them which have the rule over you. This is talking about the same people, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation. So you're supposed to consider the conduct of your pastor. You're supposed to look at how your pastor behaves. You're not supposed to blindly follow a pastor. You're supposed to consider 
the end of his conversation. Okay, and this is not a rare thing. Have a look, for example, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3, and verse number 7. 2 Thessalonians 3, 7 says, <clears throat> For yourselves know how you ought to follow us. This is Apostle Paul saying. He says, you know how you ought to follow us. He's saying, you need to be following after us. But that's not where it stops. He says, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Mm -hmm. You know how you ought to follow us, but we know you know how we behaved. So it's not as just we're going to blind you. It's like, same thing, considering the end of the conversation, seeing how it is that they behave. Have a look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Mm. Well, what if I don't follow Christ? Then don't follow me. Okay, and that's an important thing. It's a really important thing that we need to understand. We need to understand that, mm. you know, mm. we shouldn't blindly follow anyone. We shouldn't mm. blindly trust mm. anyone. Mm. Okay, now, an exa something I've often used, people who preach this about this, this, You've disobedience to the pastor. You know, I mean, I've, I've, I've even heard people preaching, you know, sit down, shut up, and obey authority. I've heard people talk about that sort of stuff. Yeah. Well, and one of the examples that they use, they do, often use the example of David and Saul. Okay? Yeah. So remember King Saul in the Old Testament, and then David before he was a king. Okay? Now, to actually turn to 1 Samuel 24, just so you can see it here. 1 Samuel 24. Um, 1 Samuel 24. And so Saul was the king, but remember what happened to him. He started out well, he was little in his own sight, he was humble. But then what happened to Saul? He became lifted up. He became lifted up in pride and thought that he was someone pretty special. Okay? And often when people get put into the situation of where they are in power, they can be lifted up with pride. And when they lift, get lifted up with pride, then they, they end up doing things that they shouldn't do because they've I mean, who's, have you heard the expression, power corrupts? Mm. And absolute power corrupts, absolutely. The more power someone has, the more dangerous a place that they're in. Now, the kings in the Old Testament, who appointed King Saul? Who decided King Saul was to be king? God did. Mm. God decided he was going to be king. But was that God's original plan? Mm. No, God actually wanted them just to have judges. that they were, He was to be their king. He was to rule over them, but they said, give us a king like the other nations. So it wasn't like, that wasn't God's plan, but he said, okay, you want a king, you can have a king. And so then he picked one. But we need to understand that wasn't God's plan. And so having a king, is, that wasn't a good idea. That was a bad idea. And so we see what happened to Saul. And we see throughout the kings, they got corrupted, some of them worse than others. But in Saul's case, he got to the stage where he was trying to kill David because he was jealous of David. And he tried to kill him, threw a javelin at him, you know, tried to throw a javelin at his own son. He, he basically went crazy. You know, and so, um, you know, so the, the First Samuel chapter twenty-four says that it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, it was told him saying, "Behold, David is in the wilderness of Enjedi." Mm -hmm. Then Saul took three thousand chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. He's chasing after him because he wants to kill him. And he came to the sheep cots by the way, where was a cave. And Saul went in to cover his feet, and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thee, thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily, like secretly. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him, because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with these words, and suffered them not to rise against Saul, but Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. And David rose afterward, and went out of the cave, and cried after Saul, saying, My lord the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth, and bowed himself. And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord had delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave, and, ba and some bade me kill thee, but mine eyes spared thee. And I said, I will not put forth my hand against my Lord, 
for he is the Lord's anointed. And we go on and read through the whole thing. But the point is, David could have, you know, you picture that. You're being chased. You've fled. You're a fugitive. You've been, the king wants to kill you, and you're off in the wilderness, and then lo and behold, you're hiding in a cave, and he, the king comes in. He goes in to relieve himself in the cave. He's right beside you. You could kill him. Wouldn't that sort of solve your problems? But what did he say? Look, I'm not going to stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. So he did it. Even though if anyone had an excuse to, it was David. He didn't. But people take this too far. And they say, they draw this parallel. And they say, you know, the Lord's anointed. So they say the, 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 the preacher, the pastor is the Lord's anointed. Don't stretch forth your hands against him. But what was David, what, what, what was the thing was he going to do or not do with Saul? It was talking about him killing him. Okay, that's not the same thing. As saying, well, you should just close your mouth and he can do whatever he wants and you won't say anything wrong. I mean, if we read back, what did David talk to people about it? He talked to Jonathan. What's your dad doing? He's going crazy trying to kill me. Okay? And so it's not the same thing to say, Pastor, I don't think what you're doing is right. This is, I don't think this is biblical. Can you explain why you're doing this? When the Bible says this and you're doing this, there's nothing wrong with questioning a pastor. I never want anyone to think, well, you can't question me. Okay? It's important. You should be able to question. Okay? There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And so people, they, they, they do this thing, you know. And also, just to understand, a pastor is not the same as King Saul. I mean, for one thing, Saul, he was a king. He wasn't a pastor. Now, some pastors think they are kings. They act like kings. But they're not. Okay? Um, he was hand-selected by God. Some pastors believe they've been hand-selected by God, but they haven't. The Bible says, if a, if a man desire the office of bishop, he desires the good work. If a man, just any man, okay, it's something you, you should, if you have a desire to do. Mm. Now, there's qualifications God sets out, but God doesn't have to come and speak to you and they tell you, I was called. That's nonsense. Mm. When you, okay, how did God call you? What did he do? And you read some of these people, the accounts, and they, oh, well, this happened, and this happened. It's like, no, come on. God, I mean, God wants there to be more pastors. You want to be a pastor? If you meet the qualifications, step up and be a pastor. We need more of them. We need men of God in every city preaching the gospel mm. and leading people. Mm. But this hand selected by God, I, be, I was called by God. Mm -hmm. People just make it up. It's to give themselves the sense of importance, mm. you know, um, and also, as I said before, stretching forth the hand, that's talking about not killing him. Okay? Where does it say that we should just pretend that the leadership in a church is, do, is not doing anything wrong and you know, we can't mention anything about it? They can do whatever they want and we can't say anything. Where does it say that? It doesn't say it anywhere. You see, we need to understand that, I mean, there's going to be disagreements with people. Within a church, people will have disagreements. You'll have disagreements between a pastor and people in the church. There will be disagreements. And the thing is, <coughs> when someone, when because sometimes people have disagreements and they don't see eye to eye and one person's got this story, and the best thing would actually be to have like a mediator come in between them and try and help them, help them understand the other person's point of view. That would be the sensible thing to do. But that sort of stuff should be done out in the open. But... We need to understand when someone, say you're just sitting there and you don't know anything about the situation, and someone tells one story, and someone tells another story, who should you believe? Out of those two stories, who should you believe? Well, the first thing is you should do is you should look at the evidence. And if there is no evidence, then who should you believe? Neither of them. Because you've got no evidence. So if you don't have any evidence, how can you possibly believe someone? You know, because otherwise, if you if you say, well, well, I'm going to believe that one because he's the pastor, for example, what are you doing? Mm. You're trusting in a man, and without the throughout the Bible, it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing to trust in man. You know, I mean, uh, for example, Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter number seventeen, Jeremiah chapter number seventeen, mm. verse number five, Jeremiah seventeen five says, "Thus saith the Lord, cursed." Does that sound good? Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. So when you're trusting in man, what's your heart doing? It's departing from the Lord. For he should be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, 
but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, and a salt land and not inhabited. Blessed, on the other hand though, blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The heart mm -hmm. is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. And I don't think it's a coincidence that that's right after that. Mm. He said, not trusting man, trust God. And then it says, the heart is deceitful. So it says, should you trust your heart? No. Well, should you trust someone else's heart? No. Okay? It's a dangerous thing to do, you see? It's not... Um, maybe this is an important thing to understand. Let's say you don't, someone said some story, someone said another story, you don't have evidence. Mm. It's okay to not know who's telling the truth. Because if you don't know, you don't know. But if that's the case, you shouldn't just pick a side. You should just reserve judgment mm -hmm. until the facts of the matter can be established. Mm. And if they can't, then just, well, I reserve judgment. I think maybe, maybe, don't really know. That's what you should do. Okay, we should, and, and not only that, we should always be ready to reconsider things if new evidence comes to light. Because what people tend to do, they say, well, I'm just going to pick a side. More often than not, they'll pick oh, the person in authority. They must be right. They'll pick that side. And then, once you've picked a side, mm. well, you, you stay with that side. I mean, isn't that what people do? I mean, people support different sports teams. That, you know, it's like in New Zealand. You get someone in New Zealand, they'll support... A, like a, an English soccer team, they're not from there or anything like that. You know, they just and people they tend to pick. Most people in New Zealand, who do they support? They support. Um, there's a lot of Arsenal supporters, a lot of Manchester United supporters, Liverpool supporters, because at various times these teams have had, you know, they've won lots of trophies, so the people support them. Mm. But once you pick a team, what tends to happen? They stay with them, don't they? Mm. They, they don't sort of jump ship unless you're some mercenary, you jump ship because you'd go for a different winning team or something. But that's, once people decide, they stay with them. Mm. And so, but that's what can happen in arguments. You pick a side, and then it's like, well, because you've decided, oh, he's probably right, then you just stay with that, even when new evidence comes to light. So that was just an important thing we need to understand. This idea to say, mm. touch not the Lord's anointed, do my prophets no harm, that doesn't mean pastors have free reign to do whatever they want. It doesn't. Okay, um, Let's get back to Genesis 20 because time is getting on. Genesis chapter number 20, verse number 8. Genesis 20, verse 8. Mm -hmm. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears, and the men were sore afraid. Um, so, yeah, Abimelech, he tells, he tells them, look, this is what God says. You know, and they're frightened. Verse 9. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. So Abimelech tells Abraham off. He's saying, look, you've done things that shouldn't be done. What has he done that shouldn't be done? He's lied. Should Abraham have been going around lying? No. That's something that he shouldn't have done. But he did. Was Abraham a great man? Was he a righteous, holy man? Was he someone who was anointed by God? Someone who was a, one of God's prophets? And yet, what did he do? He lied. Okay, Verse number 10. Um, and Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? Basically he's saying, look, why did you do that? Why did you do that? And that's a question we should all remember to ask. When someone does that, why did you do that? What was the reason why you did that? Verse number 11. Um, and Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. So Abraham thought that the place he was going to was a wicked place where God is not feared. Well, doesn't it sort of make the question come forward, why was he going there? <laughs> why was he going there? If this is a place where they fear God, is it, is it somewhere you should be going? Mm. You know? I mean, if you think of a place, a wicked place where people don't fear God, mm. how about the pub? Is that a God-fearing place? Or is it a wicked place? Mm. Is the pub a place you should be going? No, it's mm. not, okay? Mm. And, and so don't be surprised if you go there that bad things happen. You know, foolishness goes on. Mm. Um, verse, number, verse number 12. And yet, indeed, she is my sister. This is Abraham speaking. Yeah. She is the daughter of my father. 
but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. So what does Abraham do here? He's told a lie, but he's, he's kind of justifying it. You know, He's saying, well, actually, she's my half-sister. Now, maybe she is, but maybe she's not. The only record we have is Abraham says it. Well, he's just lied already. Maybe he's still lying. Mm. You know, we don't know. A lot of people say, yep, Sarah was Abraham's half-sister. Maybe she was, but maybe she wasn't. Yeah. Okay? So, um, but notice what he's trying to do. He's, trying to, he's, he's done wrong, but he's just trying to justify himself. He's trying yeah. to, you know, explain it away and say, well, he's not admitting to any wrongdoing. Okay. Have a look at verse number 13. <coughs> And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, This is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me at every place whither we shall come. Say of me, here's my brother. I mean, it kind of suggests it wasn't true because, I mean, um, if, if, if they did have the same father, then, then it would have been perfectly normal for her to say that. But anyway, um, he says, Say of my brother. So he asked her to do this multiple times. We saw it back in Genesis chapter number 12. But it was a silly it was really a silly idea, because if you think about it, God had promised him that Sarah was going to have a son. Remember we saw that in Genesis 18. Remember they came, they came and said, at this time, you know, this is what's going to happen. Sarah's, and not only that, hadn't he told him that he was going to be the father of many nations? So really, do you think someone's going to kill Abraham and take Sarah? It's not going to work if God's promises are true. So if, God, if Abraham believed his promises, he should never have done this. Okay, um, verse, number, verse number 14. And Abimelech took <clears throat> sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah his wife. Mm. And Abimelech said, Behold, the, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. Mm. Okay, so once again we see, just like it did back in, in Egypt, everything actually works out. You know? Um, he, 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 Abraham is blessed. God's looking after him. Even though he's done this bad thing, you would accept, you've lied to the king. You think, I mean, if, every, if he's going to kill you just because you came in with a beautiful wife, what's he going to do when he finds out you've lied to him? Okay? But everything works out fine. He restores him all this stuff. And he says, look, my land's before thee. Dwell where it pleases thee. Everything's working out fine for Abraham. And then look at verse number 16. And unto Sarah, this is Abimelech speaking, and unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver, Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other. Thus she was reproved. Mm -hmm. So Abimelech basically reproves Sarah for the deception. She tell, he tells her off. Now, you might say, what exactly did that verse mean? It sounded a bit, you know, it wasn't the easiest to understand. I'll be honest, I'm not sure exactly what it means. <laughs> you know, I've, I've read it, I've looked at other um, cross references in the Bible and, you know, using it. I'm not sure what it means. Mm. Okay? But just something to understand. It's actually okay to read something in the Bible and to not understand it. Because I'm learning stuff in the Bible all the time, and it's actually okay. Focus on the things that you do understand, and in due time, you will understand more. Okay, Focus on what we understand. And also, not only this, don't pretend that we understand everything. Like some people like to come up with an answer for everything. It's like, I mean, I could make something up, but then chances are, it'll be wrong. So I'm better off to say, look, I'm not sure what it means. You know, I mean, there's lots of things that we don't necessarily understand. Different, different, you know, there's different ways of saying things. I mean, I don't know if you ever looked in the Song of Solomon, you know, you read in the Song of Solomon and the, the compliments that he talks about, you know, giving to his wife. It's pretty unusual. It's not something that you'd necessarily understand. It talks about, you know, I mean, who's ever said to their wife, you know, your hair is like a flock of goats. You know, your teeth are like a flock of sheep. It sounds a bit unusual, you know. But just because you don't understand something mm -hmm. doesn't mean that someone can then just give their own interpretation of it, and therefore it must be true. Beware of that. Like you might have a, a, a bit of scripture that you don't necessarily understand, and you might be speaking to someone of a false religion or something, you know, some Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or something, and they'll say, and they'll take you to some scripture and say, and you might think, well, I'm not sure what that means. But that doesn't mean that what they're saying about it is true. Yeah, you understand? So important that we, that, that we, that we see these things, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but so Sarah's been reproved by Abimelech. Now look at verse number 17. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech, and his wife, yes, which he already had, and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Okay, so what we see here is that God, what did God do 
he opened the wombs of the house of Abimelech. Well, that must mean that previously he'd closed the wombs. So he'd prevented people in Abimelech's house from having children. So obviously this had happened over a period of time, because you're not going to notice. They must have been there for some time for people to notice no one's having any children. You know, they're there for, for, for a period of time. And that, that, that idea that God opens and closes, when we see that in a number of places throughout Scripture. You know, we see that, for example, Hannah. If we look at um, um, first Sa- um, there, have a quick look. First Samuel, first Samuel chapter one. First Samuel chapter one, and it says in verse number <clears throat> of, of verse number five, for example. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. Verse number 6, and her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. So there's a guy there, he had two wives and one of his wives had children and the other one didn't, Hannah. And, and he loved Hannah but God had shut up her womb. Now, it didn't last forever. She ended up, she was the mother of Samuel. And in fact, she had multiple children after that. Okay, but we see this principle that God does close people's wombs. And also he opens people's wombs. Um, same thing we see with Rachel and, and Leah who were... Who were um, uh, who were married to, to Jacob, you know, that they, um, that Rachel couldn't have children. Her womb, God withheld from her the fruit of the womb for a period of time. And, and then they, won't go into the story, but they took things in their own hands. But eventually, her womb was open and she did have, okay? And so we need, we need to understand, we need to be, this, we need to be patient, okay? A lot of people, the, the, there's different extremes you can go into. Like some people get into the extreme and say, well, look, every time someone has a, has a baby, it's because God has opened their womb. And every time they can't have a baby, it's because God has closed their womb. Well, I don't believe that that's what the Bible teaches. Okay? I don't believe that's what the Bible teaches at all. I mean, there are things, there are things that we do that influence whether people have children or not. Okay? For example, if a husband and wife never come together, are they going to have children? They're not. Now, there's one instance where that did happen, and that was, remember, the Virgin Mary. Mm-hmm. Mm. But that's the only instance, okay? Mm. If the husband and wife don't come together, there's not going to be any children, mm-hmm. okay? That's, that's just a fact. And the fact is, mm-hmm. when people who aren't husband and wife, when they come together, there's, there's a high likelihood that there's going to be children. I mean, you just have to look around. Aren't there plenty of solo mothers all over the place that have got umpteen children? Absolutely there are, okay? And it's not that God's opening all of these wombs and closed. There, there are factors that people do, but at, but at the same time, there are times when God says, no, I'm going to close the womb. Mm-hmm. And there are times when God will open the womb. If you are, you know, and, and we read about people who, who prayed you know, for 20 years. You know, um, Isaac and Rebecca, you know, they prayed and God opened the womb, okay? So it's important we, we need to understand that. Mm-hmm. God, um, God can overrule. You know, so there's the normal things, there's the normal, it's, it's like a law of sowing and reaping. Think if you've got a garden, okay, you've got a garden, if you don't plant anything, you're not, you're not going to grow anything. But if you plant, in all likelihood, you will grow something. And that's what you sow, that's what you're going to reap. But having said that, God still provides the rain. God still provides the sun, he still provides, and in fact, it actually even talks about that in places where, in a city, he withheld the rain. And it withered and dried. In another place, he sent rain. So God can alter things, but by and large, it's generally it's what you know what you reap and what you sow. That's what you're going to reap, okay? And also, just just another thing we need to notice is that the womb being opened is regarded as a blessing. It's a good thing, okay? Having it closed is a bad thing. It was like a punishment because of what Abimelech had done. That's what had happened, okay? That doesn't line up with the world's thinking. The world today. That, that doesn't the world think that you know maybe the children are a bit of a pain? You don't want to have too many children, mm. and that um, you know having the womb closed that would be a good thing. I mean, don't people pay money? They get all these devices and ways so that they don't don't have to have children. Okay, mm-hmm. and so we need to understand that mm-hmm. in the Bible, children are a blessing, mm-hmm. and my children are a blessing. You know, I mean, some people they think, well, how many children have you got? You know, why are you having so many children? It's like, I, you know, as many children as God wants to give me. I'm happy to have as many children as God wants to give because they're a blessing. I love all of my children. And if people think, oh, well, you know, you shouldn't have that many children. So well, which ones, are my, which of my children do you think I shouldn't have? <laughs> you know? It's, it's crazy to think that, okay? Yeah. But I, I'm not going to focus on that now because there is one other thing I, I just want to mention as we go through here. So 
Um, basically, to learn from this chapter, there's, there's three things specifically we want to, we want to learn. One, is just, just as we finished off, we saw the womb being opened, that's a blessing. Having it closed, that's not a blessing. And God can do either one. When people leave his plan, they start to do things to close the womb themselves. That's a bad thing. They use um, many forms of birth control, for example, birth control pills, that <coughs> actually result in silent abortions that people don't even know because it makes the womb a hostile place. So a baby still gets conceived and it can't survive and it dies. That's what happens. And then often when people come, that's why when people come off birth control pills, it can take a, an extended period of time after this before they can have children because of all this, the, the stuff, the drugs they've been taking. But then you have the other way. People sometimes try and open the womb when God is not allowing it to happen at the, at the minute. Or it might even not even be God that's not. It could just be, there could be some other reason for it. It could be their own health or, or other you know, stresses in their life. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of women don't have children because they work and they're stressed. And when they actually stop and relax, they conceive. You know, that's, that's, that's quite a common thing. Okay, but what people do, they take it in their own hands and they, they, they might use something like IVF. IVF, which results in babies dying. For every baby that gets born, there's a whole pile that they were conceived outside the womb. Some of them are thrown away because they're not up to standard. Some are put in the freezer and, to be honest, people are probably going to forget about them and eventually they'll clean out the freezer. You know, because there's, there's millions and millions of them. Okay, so... Um, Opening and closing, that's something that we shouldn't be looking to take into our own hands outside of you know, God's parameters. But then the second thing, we saw God protects his servants. Okay? Um, that, was, that was in particular his prophets, which is what we should all be. Remember it said he poured out his, his spirit on his you know, sons and daughters. We should all be preaching the gospel. We should all be prophets. Okay? We shouldn't all be preaching behind a pulpit. That's not a place for a woman to be preaching. But man, woman, boy, girl should be preaching the gospel in all the world to every creature. That's what we should be doing. Okay? Um, Abraham, he didn't really need to worry about his or Sarah's safety because of what God had already promised him. Okay? And there's many places we could, we could look in, you know, in, in, in Psalm 37. You know, I, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread. God promises blessings to the righteous. He does. And, so, and, right, and, and wasn't Abraham, he'd be one of the most righteous people around. There's no doubt about that. Okay? Um, but then the third thing we need to remember is that even righteous godly men, which is what Abraham was, they can lie. They can lie. I mean, you'd have to say Abraham was probably the godliest man around, like Job was in his day. Ab Abraham probably was. But what did he do? He lied. So is it possible for a righteous godly man to lie? Okay, what about this then? Is it possible for a pastor to lie? Absolutely it is. Okay. In fact, it actually says in Romans 3, 4, it says, Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. So if every man a liar, is a liar, not only is it possible for a pastor to lie, it is certain that a pastor will lie. In fact, every pastor will lie. You say, but you're a pastor. Well, guess what that means? Sometimes I will lie. I guarantee it. I mean, who's going to put their hand up and say, I will never lie from now to the day I die. Who's going to put their hand up and say that? I'm not going to put my hand up because I know it's not true. And if I tried to make out that, I'd be a liar, you know? Okay, so the quick, but here's another question though. Is he going to lie from behind the pulpit though? Now that's something that I'm hoping that I don't do. I really hope that I don't do that, okay? But the fact is, are pastors going to lie from behind the pulpit? Are they going to deliberately deceive people? Sometimes they will. You know, so we need to be aware of that. And this is, this is not something that you hear from, well, not from any pastors that I've been listening to. I can't remember thinking of hearing a pastor talk about pastor. Now, they'll talk about wicked false prophets and bad, but I'm talking about good, godly, righteous men who are pastors lying. I haven't heard people talk about that. Okay? And so... The thing about it is, that's what could happen though. They're definitely going to lie somewhere. They might do it from behind the pulpit. So in light of that, do you see how it's a very dangerous thing to trust what man says and not verify it, not demand evidence, okay? Not search the scriptures whether these things be so. We, that's it's such an important thing we need to understand. You see, I mean, I actually heard 
a pastor who was preaching at a big preaching conference. And he was talking about other pastors that were there, you know, because they, they get together and they, they get all these groups, you know. I mean, they, they, even the, these independent Baptists, they group together and it's like they're not so independent. They're, they're like a denomination with, by another name, you know. Um, and I heard this pastor say, in fact, he was praying. And he said, talking about the other pastors there, he said, when they preach things, Lord, we can trust it. And we can follow it. So he was, as he was praying, he was talking to God, but it was in front of all the people, and they were all listening. And he was saying, when these other preachers, when they preach, we can trust it. He was saying, you can trust these men. That's what he was saying. Even though I've even heard some of these same preachers preach in the past, don't trust man. Trust God. You know? And the thing is, you can see the signs of people when they, when they trust men. I mean, another, another pastor I saw, someone had, had made a comment, and they were talking about the issue of women preaching, or women speaking in church. And obviously, you know the Bible's clear that they shouldn't be preaching in church. But there's someone was talking about stuff to do with, oh, with someone giving a testimony in church. And then someone giving a testimony, but they were standing behind the pulpit and doing it. And someone was saying, well... Kind of got a sort of an appearance of evil to me. It doesn't look quite right. A woman standing behind the pulpit, stalking, talking to a congregation of people. You say, oh, well, she, wasn't, she wasn't preaching, she wasn't teaching. She was just giving a testimony or something like that. But the thing about it was, and I'm not going to talk about the, the rights or the wrongs of that, but what I will say is this. A pastor, because someone questioned it, and a pastor replied, and his reason, he said, was, well, pastor so-and-so, his wife speaks in the, in the service at this time, and that was why it was okay. Isn't there something wrong with that? Isn't there something seriously wrong with it? It must be okay because pastor so-and-so does it. You see, just because someone else does it, that doesn't make it right. You know? I mean, at the same conference, I saw someone would preach a sermon, and do you know what happened at the end of the sermon? Everybody applauded. Preach a sermon, they prayed, and at the end of the sermon, people applauded. People clapped. You might think, well, is there anything wrong with that? Is there anything wrong with clapping at the end of a sermon? I personally think there is. I think there's something actually wrong with that. I mean, if, I, if I'm mistaken, please show me in the Bible where I'm mistaken. But when you clap someone, you're applauding them. What are you doing? You're praising them, aren't you? Now, when someone stands behind the pulpit, what they're supposed to be doing is delivering a message from God to the people. So... If you want to applaud anyone, it's God you should be applauding. And I mean, some crazy charismatics, they do, they do all that sort of stuff. I'm not going to get into that. That's just not what I'm talking about. These people weren't doing anything like that. They were clapping the people who preached. They were praising them. And it's a dangerous thing. It sounds like what the world does. I mean, when people speak in the world, don't people applaud them? That's normal. Someone gets up and they speak to a whole pile of people, they give their big speech and they finish, and there's all this applause. That's not what it should be like in God's house. It's supposed to be about God. It's not supposed to be about the person. And you see these same people who are saying, trust us, trust us. What are they doing? The people are applauding them. I hope that, that, that I never end up in a If I ever end up in a situation where I'm preaching at a conference and people are applauding, I'm going to get up I'm going to tell them no it's wrong. Don't do it. I don't want to hear a clap. I don't want to hear a single clap. Because you should be listening, seeing what the Bible says, deciding if it's true or not. You don't need to... Why clap me? Why clap a pastor? Why, why clap a... Because what you're doing, you're lifting them up. And that's that whole thing that gets this person, well, I'm going to believe what he says, I'm going to trust him. And, and that's what you see. It's this, it's this idea of man worship. This concept of man worship, and you see it within churches, and it's wrong. Okay, so important we understand this. We need to understand righteous, godly people still tell lies, so we shouldn't trust them. We shouldn't lift them up. We shouldn't believe every word they say. Okay, it's an important principle that we need to understand. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray that you'd give each one of us a heart to understand your word to trust in you, not to trust in man. Lord, the temptation is there for every man when he's in a position of authority 
to be lifted up with pride, just like King Saul was, to be lifted up with pride and to turn aside from the right way. Lord, I pray that you would keep um, each one of us from that situation, Lord. Help us to be little in our own eyes as Saul was at the beginning. To be like David was when he's, when he's corrected, that he would accept it, that he would repent. Help us to, to trust you, Lord. To know that you protect us. Thank you for the protection that you provided for Abraham and knowing that you provide it for each one of God's people, each one of God's prophets, Lord. Help us to trust you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.